This week, the Pope gets a Twitter feed, the Church celebrates the Immaculate Conception, and we tell you who's been visiting the Apostolic Palace and who's going where. Welcome to Vatican Connections, a weekly look at what's been happening in the Curial Palaces. I'm your Vatican Connection, Alicia Ambrosio. This week was a full week with lots to talk about, so let's get started. Saturday was the Feast of the Immaculate Conception, which is also a holiday in Italy in the Vatican. Pope Benedict XVI made his annual pilgrimage to the Spanish Steps to lead a prayer service at the foot of the column and statue that commemorate the Declaration of the Dogma of the Immaculate Conception. Now today, the feast is a holy day of obligation, but did you know that there was once debate over the Church teaching that Mary was conceived without sin? CNS has more. The dogma of the Immaculate Conception is that Mary, from the first moment of her conception, was free of original sin. She's freed thereby of any need to overcome a deficiency in her will by which she would not habitually be open to choosing the good and choosing God. The origin of the feast, uh, sometimes called the Conception of Mary, sometimes called the Immaculate Conception of Mary, dates back uh, probably to the 9th century. When St. Thomas Aquinas came along in the 13th century, he held that by Immaculate Conception, those who were celebrating the feast meant that Mary received the singular privilege of being freed from original sin almost at the instant of her conception, but not from the very first instant of her conception. His concern was not to divorce the Blessed Virgin Mary from the rest of humanity, which needed and needs redemption by Jesus Christ. The Franciscans, led by one of their great theologians, Duns Scotus, used the expression that through the merits of Christ, even though Mary lived before, of course, Christ's passion and death, but through the merits of Christ, our Blessed Mother was preserved from sin right from the moment of her conception. And in the end, that is the version that won the day and found its way into the dogmatic formulation of Pope Pius IX. The night before Pius IX proclaimed the dogma of the Immaculate Conception, the Dominicans in Rome gathered together in the Basilica of Santa Maria Sopra Minerva to pray together that the Pope would not proceed with the dogmatic definition. The next day, the Pope did proceed with the dogmatic definition. The question, of course, is did they all immediately believe? Well, I think it's unrealistic to expect that they believed immediately. Nevertheless, they were bound to try to figure out how to harmonize the need that everybody, including the Virgin Mary, has of redemption by Jesus Christ with the text of the dogma. A dogma is a uh, proposition, that means a sentence or a couple of sentences which very pithily express a Catholic truth in such a fashion that that truth is not subject to being reformed or changed later on. Something like the Immaculate Conception means thought about whether she was conceived immaculately or uh, redeemed in a special way a little bit later on is over. Technological innovations abound at the Vatican. The Pope app was launched, giving people access to live streams of papal events and feeds from six Vatican webcams, as well as news alerts. But the big news is that the Pope is officially on Twitter. His handle is at Pontifex, and he's tweeting in eight languages. Catholic News Service spoke to Claire Diaz Ortiz from Twitter's Innovation Department the day that the Pope's Twitter page was launched. The thing we 
see with religion and the thing that's so interesting about religion to me and why I enjoy sort of what I do and getting to work with religious leaders on this space is that their engagement levels are really through the roof. So if you look at an average uh, pastor in comparison, you look at his number of followers and you compare that to, to let's say an LA film star, you see that engagement per number of followers is so much higher for a religious leader. And what this tells us is that this is the kind of material that people on Twitter on Twitter want to want to connect with and want to hear about more. We walked into the press conference this morning and the main account, because today we launched eight accounts, but the main one in English at Pontifex had 11 followers when we walked in. And the last time I checked, it had 14,000. And we're still standing in, in the room of the press conference. So that's a pretty, pretty great feat already. The Pope isn't composing the tweets himself. Other officials are doing that, but he is personally approving each tweet. He tweeted for the first time on Wednesday during his general audience. And what was his first tweet? He said, Dear friends, I'm pleased to get in touch with you through Twitter. Thank you for your generous response. I bless all of you from my heart. The papal Twitter debut prompted other ecclesiastics to take to the Twitter sphere. Ottawa's Archbishop Terence Prendergast launched his own Twitter page. His handle is at Arch Terentius. His first tweet went public on December 5th after a meeting with Catholic school principals of Ottawa. A papal decree laying out new guidelines for Catholic charities was released. We'll have more on the motu proprio called at the service of charity later in the show, but Catholic News Service spoke to Cardinal Oscar Maradiaga, the head of Caritas International, to get his take on the Pope's message. There is always the temptation to consider that the works of charity are only social works. Of course, there are social works, but there are many, many institutions, many NGOs, especially in our times, that uh, have nothing to see with faith. And so they are, okay, philanthropy is a good feeling. I feel okay when I do this or that. Well, we are not acting such as another NGO. We are motivated by faith. We are doing what we do because we are believers. The Knights of Columbus are in Rome co-hosting a congress called Ecclesia in America, along with the Pontifical Commission for Latin America. The congress is focusing on the church in the American continent. And it opened with a Mass at St. Peter's Basilica, celebrated by Cardinal Marco Olet. Pope Benedict later addressed the participants in both Spanish and English. We'll have more on that later in the show, including an exclusive interview coming up next. Did you know the Knights of Columbus have a long history of working with the Vatican? In 1922, the organization built playgrounds throughout Rome. Some of those playgrounds are still in use today, including the Villa Giulia playground behind the famous Villa Borghese. As we mentioned earlier, the Pope decided that there need to be some new guidelines for Catholic charities. He wanted to avoid Catholic charitable organizations becoming just like any other social service agency. The motu proprio he issued is called Intima Ecclesia Natura, the deepest nature of the Church, at the service of charity. Father Peter Bui is an official from the Pontifical Council Cor Unum, and he tells us more about this papal decree. Father Bui, can you tell us why these new guidelines were issued? The origin or the, um, uh, how it came about, this motu proprio, can be found in the, in the number 32 of the Holy Father's encyclical, De, Deus Caritas Es, mm -hmm. uh, where the Pope had already said or mentioned that the bishop is the primary responsible of the church's charitable works. And uh, within the, this encyclical, he also mentioned that there is a gap in the code of canon law because it does not uh, go into depth what this responsibility of the bishop concerning charitable works entails. So according to these guidelines, what is the role of a bishop in regards to Catholic charities? It is the, the responsibility of the bishop of encouraging the faithful to be involved in charitable work. 
to be witnesses of charity and to encourage the beginning growth development of charitable institutions within his diocese. Um, there's also the duty of guiding, coordinating, and monitoring the activities of charitable institutions, for example. Uh, also the attention to the choice and formation of uh, charitable workers or charitable personnel. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and finally, the, the uh, clarity or the uh, transparency of uh, finance, finances and ensuring that um, these charitable institutions maintain their Catholic identity. And how will this change things for Catholic charities, or, or does it at all? The Motu Proprio also has given two tasks which we can say new to the Pontifical Council, mm -hmm. Coonum. The first of this is uh, to promote the application of these norms that have been uh, the, uh, um, made public, and then uh, to ensure that it is applied at all levels. Uh, the second task for Coonum is uh, Coonum will have the competence to establish canonically charitable institution at the international level. What does that mean? Like to canonically establish charitable institutions at the international level. Can you give us an example? Very well. Uh, suppose um, that there's a um, in, uh, there, there's a or, uh, charitable organization that is going to uh, um, not be dependent upon uh, or not is established by by um, um, bishops' conference. Mm -hmm. but uh, by lay people who are working, uh, who will be involved internationally, um, they would have to um, be, they have, would have to uh, seek the um, canonical establi establishment, we say, from Koonum. You mentioned that until now we've known that one of the duties of a bishop is to do works of charitable service, but that there's been no definition of how a bishop should do that. What else do we need to know about these guidelines? So this legislative framework is not, I would say, an end in itself, mm -hmm. but serves to show that the charitable service of the church should be uh, the church's great witness to God who loves uh, mankind and wants him to be happy and fully satisfied, not only in, in body, but also in soul. So I think that's uh, a very important uh, um, key aspect to understand this. Thank you, Father Bowie. Another regular occurrence at the Vatican is what's known as rinunce in nomine, or resignations and nominations. There were a few this week, so let's take a look at who's going where. Kiwatan La Paz has a new archbishop. The Pope appointed Bishop Murray Shetland of Mackenzie Fort Smith as Archbishop of Kiwatan La Paz and Administrator of Mackenzie Fort Smith until a new bishop is appointed for that diocese. Because he's already ordained to the episcopate, Bishop Shetland automatically takes on the title of Archbishop and in about a month, a mass of installation will be celebrated as he formally takes the reins of the archdiocese. The Pope's personal secretary, Monsignor Georg Gansvein, has been appointed Prefect of the Papal Household. He will become an Archbishop, and it seems that he will act as both personal secretary to the Pope and head of the Papal Household. The post was previously filled by the American Archbishop James Harvey. He, of course, became Cardinal and Archpriest of St. Paul's Outside the Walls in November. Bishop Charles Shakluna also has a new job. If that name sounds familiar, it's because he was promoter of justice for the Vatican up until October when he was named Auxiliary of Malta. This week, he was appointed a member of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, the same congregation where he handled sexual abuse cases. This appointment shows that there will be no significant change in the way the congregation handles clerical sexual abuse cases. Another appointment was that Australia has a new apostolic nuncio. Archbishop Paul Richard Gallagher has been serving as nuncio to Guatemala, and he now becomes the Pope's ambassador to Australia. The Pope also appointed Monsignor Pio Vito Pinto, the new president of Vatican City State's Court of Appeal. And, although it's not technically a papal appointment, We've learned that Canada's ambassador to the Holy See, Anne Leahy, has finished her term in Rome and will be returning to Canada.
We wish her the best in her new endeavors, whatever they may be. Vatican Connections is interactive. We answer your questions and explain things you want to know. You can reach us on Twitter at Vaticonnections or by email at info at saltandlighttv.org. We'll try our best to answer your questions during this part of our show. Pope Benedict keeps a full schedule of meetings and audiences with lay organizations, church officials, and of course with the faithful who come to his general audiences. Let's go through the papal agenda this week. Last Saturday was the Feast of the Immaculate Conception, and Pope Benedict celebrated in the way that has been a Roman tradition since the 1920s, by going to the Spanish Steps to lead a prayer service. In a brief homily, he said, Mary is a reminder that silence is necessary for hearing God's word. The gospel reading for the day was about the Annunciation, and Pope Benedict said what struck him was that this decisive moment for human destiny is wrapped in great silence. He said, it was an event that if it happened in our day, wouldn't leave a trace in the newspapers or magazines, because it is a mystery that takes place in silence. Then last Sunday, Cardinal Ouellette presided at the Mass for the opening of the Ecclesia in America Congress, but the Holy Father made an appearance towards the end of the Mass to deliver a message to Congress participants. Dear friends, the love of Christ impels us to devote ourselves without reserve to proclaiming his name throughout America, bring it freely and enthusiastically in the hearts of all its inhabitants. Monday was the Pope's Day Off and Wednesday was the big Twitter launch day. On Thursday, his schedule picked up and he met with non-residential ambassadors to the Holy See. That is, foreign ambassadors to the Holy See who live outside Rome. He told the ambassadors that education is one of the biggest challenges of our times. Family and school are no longer reference points for information and increasingly young people turn to social networks as their only source of information. He urged these foreign governments to promote sound education of new generations that is based on solid anthropology. He also said the right to an education in correct values should never be denied. It's time now for another regular feature of Vatican Connections, something I call Roman Profiles, a look at a Roman person, place, or a tradition that shapes our church. Today, we're looking at the famous Spanish steps and how they came to play a key role in the Feast of the Immaculate Conception. The Spanish steps were designed in the 1700s, reportedly to link the Spanish embassy in the lower part of the plaza to the Church of the Trinity on the hill above. The plaza is also home to several other important monuments, the Bernini Fountain, shaped like a sinking boat, the offices of the Vatican's Congregation for the Propagation of the Faith, the Spanish Embassy to the Holy See, and a monument dedicated to the dogma of the Immaculate Conception. Popular tradition had always held that Mary was conceived without sin. A feast celebrating that was marked in various places. But it was only in 1476 that Pope Sixtus decreed a feast day for the whole Latin Church to celebrate Mary's Immaculate Conception. It still, however, was not officially part of the Church's teaching. In 1708, Pope Clement IX declared the feast day a holy day of obligation. Finally, in 1854, Pope Pius IX declared Mary's Immaculate Conception to be a dogma or teaching of the church. To commemorate the declaration, a column was erected in 1856 and topped with a statue of Mary. The column had been found under a monastery in Campo Marzio in 1777, while the statue was specially commissioned of Giuseppe Obici. The base of the nearly 12 meter tall column features statues of the prophets Moses, David, Isaiah, and Ezekiel. 220 firefighters helped inaugurate the monument in 1857, and since 1923, Roman firefighters have crowned the statue with flowers, and since 1953, the Pope is present for the ceremony. Benedicat vos omnipotens Deus, Pater et Filius et Spiritus Sanctus. Amen. 
That's it for this premiere edition of Vatican Connections. Send us your questions at info at saltandlighttv.org or via Twitter at Vaticanect. Next week, we'll have details on the Christmas setup at St. Peter's Square and the latest on what's going on in the papal apartments at the Vatican. For Vatican Connections, I'm Alicia Ambrosio. See you next time.